Right, first video for a while. It feels good. It feels good to be back, but also feels a little bit weird to be in a room talking to a camera again. But, no, I'm talking to you guys. Anyway, I, I know I said I was going to be away for like four to six weeks, and it's been a couple of months. Turns out there's quite a steep learning curve in, in having a newborn, and then we all got corona. That took another little while, so yeah, but we're all healthy again, we're all happy, everything's going fine. And yeah, I'm I'm now back and I can I can film videos and things again. And for today's video, I just wanted to give a um, little bit of explanation, a little bit of background. So today, uh, I, I talked to to Will Roman of Chiso's Boots. Will has been redeveloping or redefining. No, I think redeveloping the the way that a cowboy boot is, is put together. And it, it's a, I, I won't try and fill in the, the spaces here. It's a fascinating conversation with him and he can tell it a lot better than I can. That brings us back to something that I've been kind of toying with for a while, which is this long form content. I mean, I think the, the chat runs for about 35 minutes. I, I, I really enjoy doing these chats with people, but for whatever reason, YouTube doesn't really enjoy long form content, so I, I sort of, I, I stepped back from it. I, I didn't think that it was finding the audience that, that these guys deserve for, for taking the time to, to talk to us. So, yeah, I didn't know what to do with these or where to put them, so I just stopped doing them. Until I was, yeah, I mean, having a bit of time off, it, it lets you sort of reevaluate things, right? And I was like, okay, so I, I, I want to chat to these people, and then combine this with something that a couple of you guys said um, a few times, that uh, where can I sign up for a Patreon? And I was like, okay, I don't really, I haven't really thought about that. Then I did think about it and I was like, okay, if I'm gonna do a Patreon, what's, what added value can I, can I give to that? Because I, I know there's guys out there that are just like, okay, here's my Patreon. Um, this helps support the, the other stuff that I do on, on that channel or, or this, whatever it might be. Uh, but uh, I think that the guys who are really doing the Patreon well and doing it right, they're the ones that really provide added value on their Patreon. And I don't know why I didn't think about it before because that is the best place this long form content can live. I think I can provide something of, of interest and something a little bit extra and people can choose to um, support the, the YouTube channel, support the Patreon channel, and they can choose if they enjoy this long form content. So I, I think that that was the first step in this. And then another idea that I had along with that, I mean, I, I think there, there, there should be a theme through this. And so along with this, this idea of starting up a Patreon or providing the long form content on that Patreon, I, I think an interesting thread to, to follow through this is at the end of the interview, I was like, okay, so there, there's a certain commonality between the, the products that all of us are interested in and the, that craft and the people that are providing this. And there's an understanding of, of how this, this works. So obviously the people who I'm interviewing are gonna have an idea about who I should be talking to next. And that's how I want this, this series to develop. At the end, I was like, want to be like, okay, so we talked about this. Who should I be talking to next? I'm following this along, seeing where this takes me. I mean, this is going to be a nice way also to maybe get away from the really heavy denim content that, that I've been doing up until now and exploring other avenues of craft, of makers, of service providers, whatever it might be. And yeah, so that's a very long-winded explanation of where this long-form content and how this part of the YouTube channel is gonna develop. I still haven't thought too much about how I'm going to advertise this. Am I going to do little short snippets? Am I gonna do teasers on YouTube? Yeah, I haven't thought about that too much. I'd like to do one to two a month of these long form content. I think that's overseeable um, with also doing content for, for YouTube. And we'll, we'll, see, we'll see how that goes. I and mean, obviously it's gonna be scheduling, it's gonna be when the people have time and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
Right, okay. Uh, yeah, very long-winded explanation, as, as, as you guys are sure. And I'm going to leave it now. I'm going to hand it over to, to Will. And yeah, this, this interview here is going to be the, the full interview up on, on YouTube this time. And then we'll, we'll see how things are going to develop in the future with the, the long chats. Okay, Will, um, first thing, who are you? What do you do? Hey, uh, I'm Will Roman. I'm the owner of Chisos Boots. And I make and sell really comfortable, well-made cowboy boots here in Austin, Texas. Okay, we're going to get the, the cringiest part of the interview out of the way. This isn't a podcast, it's a video, and the guys at home really want to know. What are you wearing today? Uh, you know, look, I'm not a fancy guy other than my boots. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'm in the shop. We're going to do some work today. So just got the old shop shirt on. I got a uh, Chisos. Here we go. Here we go. Look at the Superman. Superman mode. <laughs> Chisos boots. T-shirt on underneath. you got to represent. And, yeah, of course. And uh, my trusty Chisos number ones in oh, they, uh, brushed brown. They look great. How long have they been on your uh, yeah, this is this is an old this is an old pair. This is a couple of years here. Okay, okay, they're looking really really sweet. What I was hoping for though, like with the with the fit check, you're always wearing a really really sick hat in the in the other videos, nah, in the photos. What is that? Hold on, hold on. Yeah, that's not too conducive, right? There we go. <laughs> they haven't figured out to make. Noise cans and headphones don't work with the cowboy hat yet. <laughs> That's the next thing that Apple need to work on. Yeah, well, I guess everyone Apple's got those little the little earbuds, so the earbuds would fit under the hat. Yeah, but so they just get... they just fall out, especially if you're in the back of a horse. <laughs> That's a good point. That's a good point. <laughs> oh, so anyway, yeah. But yeah, this is this is my trusty my trusty Resistol made in Texas. Um, that's yeah, I'm, I'm usually rocking that. So, day to day wear, day to wear, yeah, day to day wear, you know, it's either that or my straw hat. Hold on, you know, now that it's now that it's summer in Austin, mm -hmm. the uh, the straw hat is a little bit lighter. You know, this is beaver, um, the the resistal is beaver, so this gets a little warm. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is palm leaf, so breathes super well. I guess it's getting pretty hot over there at the moment. Uh, it's 101 degrees. Uh, right now, yeah, or yeah. it's going to be today. <laughs> okay, that's that's why. Was that a complete fit check? I think so. I say no. What are the jeans that you're wearing with the or pants that you're wearing with the cowboy? Just, just today, I'm just wearing. Uh, I don't know if you can see them there. They're just. Hold on, we get way back here. It's just a pair of dark pants. You know, nothing, nothing fancy. Usually, I wear you know uh, just my Wrangler jeans. Okay. And uh, but to be honest, because you know I'm I'm all about transparency. I ripped a hole in the seat of my pants yesterday. <laughs> That happens. So I gotta patch them up. I gotta patch them up. Anyone, that's a problem. If anyone's got any tips for me, I always wear out the bums on my pants. I, you know, I, I'm not doing anything crazy. I'm just working in them. So there's nothing you can do about that. The problem is you're just working in them. Like it, they, yeah, jeans just go after a certain time. Okay. All right. I feel happens. like mine go faster than like everybody I know. So maybe I got a bony rear end. I don't know. <laughs> Okay, that's the fit check done. And um, as you mentioned, you you make cowboy boots and roper boots. How does yes, this come around? Oh, I kind of stumbled into it, you know, ass backwards, as we say here in Texas. Uh, so I've, I I hurt my back in my twenties, uh, you know, weightlifting accident. Then I had a motor, couple couple motorcycle accidents, and uh, just lifestyle. <laughs> um, and so, where cowboy boots traditionally are just stacked leather heels with a leather insole. So when you walk, all that reverberation goes right up into your spine. And so I set out trying to fix this problem for myself. You know, I, um, I would get big boots that were too big and I would put all sorts of inserts in them from the store. And I, it just looked like goofy, like I was wearing clown shoes. And, and so one day I was out in West Texas of all places and I was sitting there and I was thinking, okay, how hard can it be to make a pair of boots? which is, you know, famous last words. And so, uh, you know, we got bookstores here. I went and got books on how to make boots. And then I started Googling it. And then I started trying to talk to people. And um, I, I ended up down in Mexico. So a lot of, you know, 90% of the cowboy boots that you see all come from Mexico. Um, there's the, some made here in the States and some made over China, which is total, you know, dog crap. And, uh, 
but yeah, the Texas bootmakers were a little kind of, you know, closed, uh, kept it close to the chest in terms of trying to bring in, you know, help out another bootmaker. And so I ended up in Mexico and um, there's a little father son workshop that I still work with today. And they helped me take kind of my academic knowledge and be like, okay, now let's actually make something. And so I designed and engineered all of our boots and they were willing to experiment and they were willing to kind of uh, support my crazy ideas. And the result is, um, is Chisos, which is super, super comfortable is our thing. But, and this is, you know, a little bit of a, you know, maybe long-winded answer, but I started cutting open other cowboy boots in the process to figure out how they were made. And I started seeing, hey, these guys aren't good materials. And some of them are using plastics or they're cheapening out on their leather choices. And so we were like, why don't we fix that too? And so the result is, you know, this well-made cowboy, it's still a dress boot, um, but you can work in it if you need to. And we got guys that do, um, but they're really comfortable. Okay. So you don't have a background. You're not like coming from, I don't know, your dad's got a boot shop or your dad's got a boot company <laughs> or something. You're just like, okay, I want to wear cowboy boots. These aren't comfy. Let's do something about it. Yeah. I just kind of followed my own interest and my own need. I mean, you know, I, I think I consider myself just kind of like the everyman. You know, in, in my whole life, uh, I just kind of done that, which is, you know, hey, I, I, how does this work? Let's figure it out. You know, I mean, think about, you know, I'm sure you, you know, when you're a kid, you start taking your toys apart or you had like, you know, an erector set or something like that. And you build things. And, you know, in my, uh, you know, early teens, even I was already starting to computer program and figure things out. And, you know, I, I don't have any experience in boot making, but, you know, previous to this, I actually did software consulting for big fortune 500 companies. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's an advantage to not know what the hell you're doing because you come in and you ask questions and you're like, well, why do we do it that way? And they're like, cause that's the way it's done. And you're like, what if we do it differently? And they're like, no, I don't think so. And I'm like, well, let's try it. And you can change things, you know, in, in concert with the guidance of someone who does have you know, domain knowledge. Um, but that kind of being an outsider is, it can play to your advantage and, and enable you to come up with things that other people are like, well, you know, we never thought about doing it that way. <laughs> Some of this stuff to me just seems so simple and obvious. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm like, why didn't this not exist? No. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's an advantage to not being stuck in traditions, isn't there? I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, that kind of brings us on really nicely um, to, to my next question is like, how, which, I, I guess it's going to be a little bit difficult just over a call, but how are a pair of your boots put together? What makes that, that difference in terms of, of comfort to uh, traditional cowboy boots or roper boots? Sure. Now, that's a great question. It's kind of the key, key question. And uh, I brought along some props today, um, which I'll talk about in just a moment. Uh, and also, just by the way, I, we made a video, uh, or me and, and Dimitri, who's, you know, my, on my, does all of our media here at Chisos, um, we made a video of us cutting open our boots in half, just like we used to do. And then we cut open some of our competitors and we kind of hold them both up and we show you what's inside. So you can see, here's what she's, how Chisos makes them and here's how these other brands make them. Uh, you know, we're not hiding anything. That kind of answers all the questions. But to show you and uh, and your audience here today, this is you know our Chisos number two in brown. This is you know if that side, hey, it looks like a normal boot, but you know cut open a cross section for you. And there's a couple of things to point out here. So I'm gonna try and get this here to the camera. So sure. this is that leather heel that I was talking about, fully stacked. Um, but this piece right here, this is the leather sole, right? So this is this right mm -hmm. here, cut open. This is, uh, if you were to cut open some of our competitors' boots, this is about twice as thick as, as standard in the boot making world, uh, for dress boots anyway, right? This is more of like a work boot caliber. And so this is just one of those points of starting with, hey, only using high-end uh, materials. This piece right here is the steel shank. You can see there, here's mm -hmm. some of the nails that come down and there's nails also in, uh, in this block that come down about right here. Mm -hmm. In this piece here, this, other piece of leather is our leather insole. Now, this is three times as thick as what other dressmakers, uh, boot makers uh, use. And the reason is that over time, your feet will actually make imprints into that leather insole. And it makes the boot become more comfortable. It fits tighter to you. 
And it really, this is why sometimes like you should buy a cowboy boot. It's a pull on, right? So you should get a cowboy boot. that fits like a firm handshake. And over mm-hmm. time, the vamp will stretch to fit to you. And then the sole on the inside will actually mold to your feet. And you end up with a custom fitted pair of, of footwear at that point. Mm-hmm. Um, so the other, the other key, couple, one more key construction issue or construction to point out is this right here. Mm-hmm. This is our leather heel counter. This is what a lot of people cut out these days and they just use Celastic. So this Celastic is this little white piece here. Mm-hmm. When the boot is being made, you have a, you have a last, which I should have grabbed for you, but it's a, it's a, you know, it's plastic or it's wood, but this is the shape of the foot. This is what we mold the boot around. And a leather heel counter, you put that around it, and then you use elastic to kind of hold the shape because leather takes about 18 hours to set and to dry onto that last. So elastic takes two seconds, right? And it's done, it dries, and it holds, which is why big mass produced boots are like, well, get rid of that leather. That takes too long. Let's just use the, the elastic, which is, you know, material canvas impregnated with plastic, and we'll call it a day. No one's going to know, right? Well, we do know now because we cut your damn boots in half. And so this makes a huge difference because it, what it means is over time that molds to your foot as your feet change, as you age, it continues to mold. It provides rigidity and support for the whole boot. That heel counter is kind of like the structural focal point of the, of the upper part of the boot. So once that goes, you, I mean, you got to do a total rebuild on the boot, okay. which with a cheaper pair of boots, you might as well just throw them out, you know, um, which isn't sustainable when isn't, you know, a mark of craftsmanship, et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, just, you got to cut me off sometimes, but the, <laughs> the last thing to point out here is our insole. So this is, it's leather topped mm-hmm. and it's made of three different materials that we've done extensive testing with here. Mm-hmm. And the idea for this is again, when you walk, that impact doesn't go into your back. It gets dissipated through these materials. The other big piece that we worked really hard on was that I still wanted this, this insole to mold to your feet like a traditional cowboy boot. And I wanted the leather insole to mold through the comfort insole. Mm-hmm. And so finding the materials that would allow for that pressure to go the correct way on your toes while still um, dissipating the energy on your heel was... Uh, I- <laughs> It was a lot of work, <laughs> a lot of a lot of just trial and error. This is the thing. You don't have to be an expert at this stuff. You go, let me try this material. Bump, bump, bump. Doesn't work. Let me try another one. You know, I mean, what was it? Edison made a thousand light bulbs. It didn't work, you know, so it's sometimes genius is just persistence. I've just got like in the in my mind that the back of your, your workshop or factory, just like a thousand boots just like strewn all over the place. We, we actually, we had. Here in Austin, we have all of our old prototypes that I made, and they're, they're everywhere. So, yeah, you're, it's, you're not wrong. <laughs> and there was something I picked up on there. I'm just curious. So you mentioned you make dress boots, and then there's working cowboy boots. Where's the, sure. where's the difference in between those? So I, I would say that we are, we're like a hybrid. You know, we build a dress boot tough enough that you can work in it. And I've got guys that are ranchers that wear our boots. Uh, even electricians that wear our boots, uh, foremen on construction sites that wear our boots. But the the main difference is if you were to take kind of a like off the shelf, you were to go get a work boot, it has it's a rubber sole boot, and a lot of times it's molded. It's not it's and it's they use glues and they use heat press seals on machines, so they don't actually scoop together mm-hmm. the way a traditionally made boot is. You know, for us, another big difference that I, I actually neglected to mention, and I um, this may be a little bit uh, esoteric to, to, to describe, but there's, you know, people talk about Goodyear welted boots these days. Well, what that is, is that's the method of how you attach the sole to the rest of the boot. And so you, if you can see here, there's actually two pieces of leather. There's a very thin mm-hmm. line. This top one is the welt, mm-hmm. and it is sewn to the sole. And what people do nowadays is they, they glue on a piece of canvas or, or they, and they sew that to the welt and they call it Goodyear welted. Well, that's kind of BS. It'll break down and lessen moisture. We use a channel welt. We actually carve a channel into that leather sole, peel it back, and we sew leather all the way through. But that whole sewing process is kind of, is different from what you would find in a, in a work boot, generally speaking. Um, a, you know, a work boot is going to want to be more waterproof. And so they'll use machines. A lot of them are made overseas. Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. uh, an exception, and you know, I'll, I'll give a shout out to them is somebody like Nick's Boots, mm -hmm. where they still do so they sew their boots together and they use thick ass leather and they build them tough. So it's 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 that's this is am I explaining this well? It's yeah, basically yeah, yeah, totally. a, a lot of it because here's the thing: a leather sole is great for dancing. It's mm -hmm. very good for dancing. Uh, it looks nice. There's a certain craft to it. Uh, but, you know, water is going to cause the fibers to expand and contract as they dry out, which will break down that sole and cause it to wear out sooner. Mm -hmm. So what the guys do that work in our boots is they'll get a, a cobbler to slap a rubber sole saver on there. Yeah. And the rest of the boot is built tough so that you can work in it. But um, a, a like a traditional kind of dress cowboy boot won't have that because you're designed to they're either the, ride in the saddle or honestly, to take the wife out to dinner. <laughs> <laughs> this brings us on something that I, I was touching on when I was doing my, my research for, for the interview. I mean, cargo boots are the style that existed for a good long time. And even though this is going to be a bit of a generalization, they are pull on, they have got a pretty high shaft, pointed toes, maybe some sort of decorative stitching, and that's big stacked heel um that, that you just showed us earlier and that that stack has got a a bit of a, a taper on it mm -hmm. but i'm just wondering why these features what are the the practicalities behind these that's a great question so and, and it's kind of interesting so you know if you look at i mean cowboy boots are kind of the color i mean they, if you really want to trace them back people think they came from like the wellington boot uh, in Britain originally, mm -hmm. and then they get brought over, they get influenced by the Spaniards, they get influenced then uh, by te Tejanos and Texans and, and Mexicans. And, but the, the, the cowboy boot as we know it today really came into its own in about 1860 to 1890. And mm -hmm. this is when the cowboys in Texas were wrangling up the cows and doing massive migrations north so they could go to slaughterhouses and, and feed the country. Uh, a side note, the that 30 year period is the biggest migration of mammals in the history of planet Earth. Wow. Uh, it's it's it, it, the scale of the cattle drives in the United States uh, were unprecedented and will probably never, ever happen again. It, it, it's, a, it's a wild story. You can go down a whole Wikipedia rabbit hole just reading about that. But uh, the cowboy boot was designed, hey, why do we have a heel and why do we have a pointy toe and why do we have a high shaft? Well, we wanted we're riding boots and uh, right. Excuse me, we're riding horses. And so we wanted to get in, into the stirrup. And that's why you have that point toe or, or, or a narrow tapered toe at the front, because when you get on your horse, you want to slide into the stirrup. That's also part of why you have the leather, not something like rubber, because, again, you want to slide leather over leather into that stirrup. And then you want that heel to catch in the back. And then on here, then, and then, of course, we eventually developed spurs that we would put on the heel rand. But that's the whole idea for the for the primary part of the boot down here is it's made to ride a horse. Mm -hmm. um, the uppers then were to protect your your legs uh, from brush and from rattlesnakes and things of that nature. And it, later on, we developed, you know, full on uh, uh, chaps uh, that people wear over their jeans. But. A lot of times you'll still see it today. Cowboys will put their jeans or their pants into the boots, and uh, and and that's how they help protect their ankle and, and their and their lower part of their leg when they're riding, you know, from from brush and other things. So and then then you asked about some of the, the designs and the embroidery. So 1860 to 1890 was kind of like the the core period of of the classic cowboy, um, and then. Uh, barbed wire had been invented and we and we kind of fenced off the west and so the big cattle drive stopped happening and you still have cowboys of course which are still running the ranches well in the early part of the 20th century i'm trying to remember if this is 19 the teens or the 20s i think it was the 20s hollywood discovers the cowboy and they go and they start creating this myth of the american of the american west um you even have uh I'm forgetting the name of the show, but the show that would travel around the United States and then it traveled around Europe even, uh, you know, showing off the American cowboy and they would have these fake cowboys versus Indian stuff. And so it kind of captured the imagination of, of the population. And so they became, started to become more of a fashion thing. Well, cowboys themselves then wanted to start to show off. And so people started to decorate the shafts with fancy embroidery. 
And so they that's where the, the, the style aspect came into it. The heels even got taller. The toe shape started to change. I mean, so then it became this thing about how it kind of had the most ostentatious uh, boot out there. And, um, and, it, 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 and that was kind of the origin of those design aspects. You had, you know, individual, again, this is still mostly individual bootmakers at this point before they started, you know, they, again, they, they started to make, you know, there were still Justin boots and Acme boots, some of these other original guys that were creating um, workstations and making, you know, assembly lines out of it. But a lot of them were still individual, individual uh, bootmakers. And so they would show off their skill by having multiple rows of stitching that all lined up, you know, they were doing it by hand, you know, um, so it, it became this this whole, you know, I mean, it's, it's like when when style takes over, people like to show off a little bit, show off their skills, yeah. show off their 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 curation of what they get to pick. Um, so that's the core of the cowboy boot. Um, it's nice to what, know. That, it's nice to know that this this happened like way back when, when there's this perception of like, yeah, no, there was no um, flair put into anything. There were manly men that were just into the practicality. It's like. No, we want to show off our cowboy boots. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you know, I mean, men, look, men always figure out a way to show off. I mean, you can go back to what the renaissance, the wigs and the high heels yeah, and all that kind of shit. And they're like, this makes me manly. <laughs> <laughs> um, w- one other uh, little attributed point is so there's the cowboy heel, which was re- actually the riding heel is generally about this big. This is called a walking heel. And then I don't have one next to me, but uh, a roper heel is even shorter and ropers were developed about the 1940s. And because, so cowboys are doing the big cattle drives, then they're working on ranches. Well, you know, we, we like to compete. And so they would start to, uh, you know, do these competitions with each other about who can rope fastest and that type of stuff. That's what developed into the modern rodeo. So a rodeo essentially used to be, is but used to especially be just a bunch of cowboys who wanted to prove who was best at doing cowboys uh, you know techniques uh and so they would get together well there was they started to do this item where you ride the horse you rope a calf you jump off you run up you flip it on its back and you tie the legs so that whole jumping off the horse and running up they were like, we want to make this easier. And so that's where they started to lower the heel and they developed a roper, which is specifically for the competition of roping calves. Yeah, that was just driven by the practicalities of this, this competition. Correct. And you've got them in the lineup as well, if I'm right, or? We do, yeah. So we, um, we launched originally just with two cowboy boot designs. And now we have one, two, three, four, five, plus a couple of specialty items that are cowboy boot shaped. And then we have a whole lineup of four different ropers now as well. Cowhide and an ostrich. I saw the ostrich, the really fancy ones. Yeah, they're the king roper. They're they're spectacular. They are spectacular. <laughs> that, that's my that's my, either that or we, you know, I don't know if you know, but we did a boot of Texas alligator. Okay. Or I went hunting in east texas there's never been a boot company that made an alligator boot from texas gators they all get them farmed in louisiana or or they make it crocodiles from egypt so i went hunting out in the swamps shot some gators with my buddies got them tanned and we made boots from them yeah those are those are probably the ones i'm the proudest of yeah those those in the king ropers are 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 you know our creme de la creme i mean like with this this whole idea of that putting a certain degree of style into the into the cowboy boots. Um, I think this extends to a lot to, to what we see as, as Western style. I mean, this is workwear for a lot of guys, right? We touched on that a little bit before. There's these two different kinds of, of, of boots and sort of different features in, in, in each. But as a Texan, and you seem a very, very proud, very dedicated Texan, what do you think about this, this Western style becoming more popular in a in a fashion sense look uh you know it's it's an interesting time you know the the, one of the things is that if you look at cowboy boots and kind of their surge in popularity you know texas has always worn boots um even today in the united states 50 percent of cowboy boots are bought in texas so you look at the whole country with which is you know what 330 million people something like that texas is 30 million of that so our 30 million buy as many cowboys as the other 300 million people. <laughs> so we like cowboy boots, but 
the you know if you looked at the the popularity outside of texas it's always kind of gone with moved with hollywood you know you'd have that early swing in the 19th century or the 20th century then you had i think like urban cowboy and even top gun in the 80s and so you have this kind of resurgence that's you could market like how many boots people were selling now we have yellowstone and that type of driving cowboy boots but we had before yellowstone came out we were experiencing the in the the, the 20 teens the first kind of wave of cowboy boot popularity that was not tied to Hollywood. Um, so there it's that what that tells me is that there is this interest in what the cowboy boot represents. Um, you know, and for me, you know, there's, there's this, you, you pull on a pair of boots in the morning and it's a little bit like pulling on the uniform, you know, you know, you, you stand a little taller, you stand out a little bit, and there's this sense of kind of, of pride for me, you know, obviously Texan pride, but mm -hmm. there's also a sense of responsibility is that I am kind of a representative for, for people who, who still kind of embrace this, these ideas of independence, of taking part, you know, taking care of your community and, and, and self um, being, being uh, independent and self-reliant. Mm -hmm. And, and so I think that what's, what's happening is you're seeing uh, people around the world are kind of, uh, being drawn to those ideals and the boot represents it. So it's not just like a cool shirt or something like that. There's a bit, there's a, there's an identity that that comes with it and, and, and a sense of values that come with it. You know, one of the things that's super awesome for us is that we ship worldwide. And so there are people wearing Chisos, you know, on the British Island, there's people in France, there's people in um uh singapore there's a whole bunch in australia there's a group of of uh uh people in the netherlands that ride harley davidson's and wear jesus boots <laughs> cracks me up um and and so i think that there's this this the i think the growing interest in it is is awesome you know we we don't call it western wear here it's just what we wear <laughs> yeah just, yeah that's it that's it right but I, I think that it, you know, the more, the more, the merrier. Come on, y'all. Welcome to the party. <laughs> and you're, you're selling direct, right? Um, yes, sir. And you're shipping all over the world. So if I'm going to get myself a pair of Chisos boots, how do I go about sizing them? That is a great question. Um, obviously, it is the easiest if you're like, oh, hey, I own this pair, this brand of boots, you know, and we can say, great, that, that correlates to about this size. Um, you know, we, for international orders, we, we call us or email us and we'll kind of work through that and find you some comparisons. Mm -hmm. Um, if you were domestic in the United States, we do free shipping and, uh, free exchanges, excuse me. So we do free. So if, you know, if you get the wrong size, no big deal, we'll help you swap it out. International is a little bit harder. Um, I think it's, it's approximately 90 bucks to send a pair of boots anywhere in the world. So sending well, them back and sure, forth yeah. would, would add up. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you know, we've got some we've got some good guidelines, um, and you know, yeah, so reach out to us, and we'll help figure that out. Okay, I think we're pretty much at the end here, and we're just about to wrap things up. But just lastly, I've got two questions. First yeah. one is: there anything fundamental to choose those boots that we've not covered, or anything you want to plug? Basically, take the stage; it's yours. Go ahead. Well, you know, there's the there's the construction, the quality, the comfort, the craftsmanship, uh, but that stuff's kind of table stakes. You know, I think when you when you come to be part of the Jesus community, you know, you're some more supporting a true small business. You know, uh, our competitors are 200 times the size of us. You know, there's four, there's four of us here. Um, you know, as myself and I've got three people on the team, and we have a father son workshop that we work with in uh, Guanajuato, Mexico, that we go back and forth with. So, there's, it, you know, it, this is a a small business. The every purchase makes a huge difference to us. Um, and then it's kind of how we run the business. You know, uh, you know, Chisos is named after the Chisos Mountains in West Texas. It's part of Big Bend National Park, and so every sale of percentage of that goes to land conservation here in the state of Texas. And then we like to do big community events. Just this past weekend for Memorial Day, we had a crawfish boil, 
Uh, we I rented a 22 foot tall inflatable water slide, which is actually even bigger than it sounds. And we had bands, we had people out with their families, and we had other uh, brands from Austin kind of help sponsor that. And so, you know, this is this isn't just something that we're like, oh, let's build it and let's make some money and let's sell it. Like this is my life. This is how I interact in the community and and how my my team interacts in the community. And so, um, it, you know. It's, Joining this and buying a pair of Chisos um, makes a, a big difference to, to, to real people. <laughs> okay, that, that's, that's fantastic. And, um, and again, this just follows on to, to the second question I have. And just to, to furnish you and the, the audience out there with a bit of a background, um, this is the, the very start of what I hope is going to be um, an ongoing series where I talk to folks like you, um, people who are, are making things or are selling things, providing a service, whatever that might be. Um, but people who exist in this quality and in craftsmanship world, that I think myself and my audience are really are really drawn to. And because we we kind of occupy this this sphere, I think there's awareness amongst us of the people of similar outlook. It doesn't have to be a pair of boots. Doesn't even have to be a brand. It could be a guy brewing beer, making coffee, yeah, creating a service, whatever it might be. But it's just people who are are sharing the philosophy of making things very, very well. And so, with all that being said, is there anyone that I should be talking to? And can you hook me up with an intro? <laughs> <laughs> of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. I um, I will absolutely connect you with some. I know some great people here in Austin. I'll, I'll, I'll pop my head. Uh, Eric over at Beard Brand uh, is doing great things, and he's you know been a bit of a mentor to me. Um, I know Shelly over at Slow North is making candles. So Beard, Beard Brand makes uh, beard oil, and then also a whole sweet you know deodorants, shampoos, that type of stuff um, for uh, for you know. I don't know what was it called self care today whatever they call it you know you're the stuff you use in the bathroom and uh, uh grooming products that's the phrase I'm there doing. we go <laughs> and uh and then slow north makes uh a couple of things now they make they hand pour amazing uh soy candles they make sleep masks and all sorts of stuff so um there's a paul over bk beauty makes actually uh uh brushes for makeup mm -hmm. um and um you know, I can't, I can't speak to myself, but, uh, you know, I've given them this gifts and the, the, the women in, in my life love them. So um, those, those are three off the top of my head. I'm happy to make an introduction. Um, you know, Austin is really great. There's a lot of makers here and the community is, is really, really supportive. We all kind of root for each other. So that's a great question. I, I've heard it's booming over there in Austin just now. Like there's just a lot of people being drawn. There. It's it's booming. It's booming a little too fast for some. I was born here, so uh, you know, my whole life people have been like, Austin's changing, and I was like, yeah, but it's not that bad. It's pretty good. And then like the last, the pandemic, like the last two, three years, exploded, exploded. So um, we're still happy to have you. You know, uh, New York and California people, we got enough of y'all, but we'd rather some more international people. <laughs> I've got to come over and visit this, like, through the community yeah. that I've um, just, like, just, I've just met a bunch of people that have either moved down there or people from Austin. And, yeah, I, I, I've never been that far south in the States. Not yet. Oh, you come on by, we'll take you off a good brisket and show you the boot shop. That sounds perfect. That sounds perfect. That's, that's a great place to finish. Listen, thank you so much for taking the time. It's really, really appreciated. And um, yeah, I wish you a good rest of the day. Thanks, Matthew. It was good to talk to you, man. I appreciate this uh, for you, you know, bringing me on your show. Take care, man. That's great. Ciao. Right. Little outro. Uh, it's been so long since I've done this, I've kind of forgotten how. What is down in the description? Obviously, down in the description, there is, is, is links to the Chiso's website. That's really worth checking out. Go along there, have a look, see what they're doing. It's it's impressive, especially the community that they're building up around about the brand. I, I really, really enjoy seeing that. Uh, there is uh, there's a link to the CRD website with the sales page. That's worth checking out if you want a really sick pair of jeans to go with your new cowboy boots. Um, there's the no news, good news newsletter. It's always fun to, to sign up to that. Uh, yeah, what else, what else? Uh, like, subscribe, blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah, and that just 
leaves me to say, as always, I hope everyone is, is happy and healthy out there. Hope you're taking care of yourselves. Hope you're taking care of each other. And I'm going to see you in the next video.